Hello and welcome to this edition of Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and we have a very interesting show lined up for you this week, to say the least. In our debrief, we're talking Russian space nukes. Do they have them? Would they use them? Our weapon of the week is a remote-controlled, eight-wheeled thing of beauty. Plus, we've got your weekly dose of comms check, and I weigh in on the prospect of protecting peace in our wrap. But first, let's get started with some headlines you may have missed. $1 billion over the next two years. That's what the Pentagon wants to get its replicator program off the ground. U.S. Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks told reporters the DOD expects to spend half a billion dollars annually to build and deploy thousands of low-cost, smart-tech drones for any future conflicts. Once a new budget is passed, something that hasn't happened since 2023, the Pentagon plans to have the drones operational within 18 to 24 months. One key focus in innovation is overcoming institutional challenges that inhibit our ability to accelerate delivery of critical capabilities to the warfighter at speed and scale. That's the goal of Replicator, including its first focus area on all domain attributable autonomous systems and many similar initiatives the department has underway. Something to point out, the Replicator program is separate from the Collaborative Combat Aircraft program the Navy and Air Force are working on. Their flag official now, Sweden and NATO that is, earlier this month at a ceremony filled with the requisite pomp and circumstance, Sweden's flag joined those of 31 other nations as their membership into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization became officially official. One of the first questions asked of Sweden's Prime Minister was about Russia and their previous threats about taking action if Sweden joined NATO. Concerning Russia, I think we should stay alert. Stay exactly as alert as we are. Uh, they are doing all the things you mentioned. I'm quite sure they will continue doing that. Uh, we should not be naive, and I think we are, more, we are more aware of the risks that they pose to us now than we have ever been before. Sweden and their neighbors to the east, Finland, applied to join NATO after Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. While Finland completed the process last year, Sweden's membership was held up by the Hungarian parliament and Viktor Orban until they relented last month. Finally, new and improved. At least that's the Army's hope for more than 3,000 pairs of their integrated visual augmentation systems, or IVAs. The mixed reality goggles are going to be issued to units like the 82nd Airborne Division sometime this year. Earlier versions of the headsets, built with combat troops in mind, have been tested and tweaked for a few years now. The previous edition, tested back in 2022, left soldiers feeling neck strain and affected their ability to fire their weapons on target. Made by Microsoft and initially intended to be issued in 2021, earlier iterations didn't make it to the field because users complained of disorientation, headaches, and tunnel vision a problem Microsoft hopes it finally has a handle on. So remember back in February when Ohio Congressman Michael Turner, let's just say, raised some eyebrows and probably a few alarms when he said on NBC's Meet the Press that Russia was moving to make a space-based nuclear weapon a reality. Based on the intelligence you have seen, how serious is the threat? Well, the, the threat is very serious. Everyone who's looked at it uses the same language that, that I have, that it is a very serious threat. Well, for their part, the Russians said that was not the case, instead calling the statements a ploy to pressure Russia into arms negotiations with the West. Wherever the truth falls, the idea alone caused many to wonder aloud, well, what if? What if Russia had space nukes? To explore that question, we recently talked to three university professors, all of whom have an excellent grasp on what if, to see if any of this Russian space nuke talk keeps them up at night. For most of us lay people, the idea of launching weapons measured in kilotons from the vastness of space or knocking out entire satellite networks sounds like something straight out of a James Bond movie. But rest assured, the experts think so too. 
it reminds me of Goldeneye, <laughs> yeah. right? I think this is something that 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 uh, other outlets just sort of picked up on, where they can they could use an EMP device or something like that to render um, the electronics in a lot of these satellites, which are fragile, oftentimes very fragile instruments in and of themselves, useless. Russia using nuclear devices in space could come in one of a few different ways. And no, nuclear-powered space lasers are not one of them. At least not yet. Russia could launch nukes at Earth-bound targets from a space-based platform like a satellite. But ICBMs could achieve the same result. Russia could detonate a nuke in the atmosphere, knocking out anything electronic across entire continents causing mass panic and potential societal collapse. But again, missiles could do the same thing. While the existence of some of this technology and whether Russia could use it is certainly up for debate, the concerns these debates generate are valid. But the experts say we need to temper any expectations or prognostications with what we already know to be true. There's talk, uh, of course, of the Russians violating the aerospace treaty and this is the end of the aerospace treaty and all that that's that's premature not only have they not actually done this yet but uh, the soviet union designed a large part of the aerospace treaty and that's a reason russia might not want to take part in what representative turner says they could be planning for everything that's unpredictable about vladimir putin he does tend to favor whatever holdovers still exist from the soviet union but my sense is that as a state, that is certainly not in Russia's interest and that a lot of their behaviors seem to still be interested in maintaining some of those alliances, particularly with China. Elsbeth Magilton, Jack Beard, and Tyler White's expertise collide at the avenues of law, national security, and cybersecurity, making them all well-qualified when it comes to talking about the new threats from America's oldest adversaries. For most sane people, subjects like a Russian space nuke is unsettling to say the least, a feeling Magilton says she's not immune to. She also says perspective is important. When you start working in security and in defense, that notion that we were always so secure my whole life kind of goes away and you realize how tenuous it always is and always has been. And somehow that makes you feel a little bit better because you realize that we've always been walking this line. And yes, that's scary, um, but I've been safe up until now. And so maybe it's not as bleak as it feels in these moments. Well, Turner's comments grabbed a lot of headlines. There was other news regarding Russia and space, specifically their plans to build a nuclear power plant with the Chinese, a plant that would power their settlements on the moon. That's something Jack Beard says could be a much bigger issue for U.S. interests. Competition on the moon for scarce resources is, is uh, probably a more formidable threat. Um, in near term, I mean, we're talking about putting uh, people there and using the space resources. And there's, I, I'm not aware of any time in history where uh, humans haven't gone to some part of this planet, found scarce resources, had companies come and want them, and they don't get into conflict with other countries about the resources. For Tyler White, the concerns in space, at least in part, stem from concerns that are more earthbound. You know, I worry about the future of NATO, which I think has been an unbelievably productive and incredibly important thing in the history of human humankind, right? I mean, uh, a defensive alliance like this, it's, this lasted this long. Um, because, you know, the challenges posed by China, the challenges posed by Russia, those things become much easier to handle when you are in a reliable relationship with regional partners. And there's a, there's more uncertainty around the future of those relationships, and most of it's coming from the United States. Well, there are no easy or imminent answers to many, if not all, of these concerns. Magilton says the fact that American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts are living and working together right now on the International Space Station is a positive. And maybe that's enough to allow you to get a little sleep tonight. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. 
Discover stories that right and left leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Mist tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. It might be hard for the video game playing youth of 2024 to believe this was once the height of tank warfare on a video screen. Tank 1990, a game within the game of Battle City. Fast forward nearly 35 years and controlling a battle-ready vehicle on a video screen is no longer a game. Thanks to the folks at American Ryan Metal Vehicles, it's now very serious business. This is the Ryan Metal Mission Masters SP. It's an autonomous unmanned ground vehicle, or AUGV for short. The U.S. Marine Corps started taking delivery of these things last year. Built to be used in a wide range of situations with a variety of modular attachments, the Mission Master SP can be kitted out with all sorts of sensors and weapons, like a remote-controlled machine gun turret. The Mission Master can help perform armed reconnaissance, pull flank security, haul gear, and more. One reason why the Marines and other branches are interested in equipment like the Mission Master is because it's a force multiplier. That's military speak, meaning it allows a unit to do more with less, hypothetically turning a 10-person job into a 5-person job. And that makes it a valuable asset when every branch of service is facing recruiting issues. The Marine Corps recently put the AUGV to the test during a live fire demonstration at Fort Clinton in Ohio. Add to that the Talisman Saber exercise in Queensland, Australia last summer, and the Apollo Shield exercise at 29 Palms in California last fall, and it becomes pretty clear the Marines see the Mission Master SP as a good way to not only help their people in the fight, but protect them as well. Major Stephen Atkinson of the USMC's Warfighting Lab says what separates the Mission Master from other autonomous vehicles is the ability to engage targets on the ground and in the air. In December, American Rhine Metal vehicles received an order for six additional Mission Master SPs, which will end up with the 3rd Battalion 4th Marines, who will be the first to conduct pre-deployment preparations and deploy with Rhine Metal's AUGVs. All right, folks, it's time once again for Comps Check, one of our favorite uh, segments of the show. It's kind of our opportunity to peruse our social media feeds, go through our email inbox, and, you know, kind of see the comments or the questions that you have out there uh, in the audience and gives us an opportunity to address those. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first Comps Check of the week comes to us on a story that we had done about uh, some U.S. Green Berets being permanently stationed uh, in Kinmen County, which is part of uh, an island grouping that Taiwan controls. And Kinmen is just about six miles away from China. So uh, U.S. troops being stationed very close uh, to China. So the question or the comment that we got was from um, LP, I'm not exactly sure of the name, but LPGS3XJ uh, says, let's call him Leo. Leo says, as a retired Marine, I had to smile at how much footage was Marines for a Green Beret video. Well, first of all, Leo, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, and secondly, this kind of, you know, you're not, you're not wrong about anything here, Leo. This just gives us an opportunity to kind of peel the, uh, peel the curtain back, peel the onion back, and, and expose kind of the inner workings uh, to the audience. So this video and, you know, we'll play the video over me talking so you'll be able to see the video that I'm talking about, uh, is actually of Taiwan's forces. These are the forces that some American special forces have been helping to train. Uh, but also included in this story, Leo, are some other, uh, you know, news nuggets from different uh, military exercises that the U.S. Marine Corps actually is taking part in, uh, like Cobra Gold, as well as some force-on-force -force drills in Japan uh, that the, the, the Marines were participating in. Now, all of that said, uh, Leo, the story about the Green Berets, now, you know, some people call these guys ghosts. Uh, they're, they're not supposed to be known. Their identities are not supposed to be known. So it's not like any visuals or any pictures of these people training uh, exists for public consumption. Uh, 
for journalists like myself to be able to put on our videos and play it back for you. Um, so that's, that's kind of that story. Also, uh, because of the nature of a lot of this, um, of the stories that we tell, we are at the, at the mercy of what is publicly available. Um, you know, it's, it's not like we can go over to Kinman Island here and uh, put a camera in front of some of these guys' faces or gals' faces and say, hey, you know, we're going to shoot some video of you doing your thing. Uh, that's not exactly how it works. So when we do put together these stories, uh, please trust, Leo, that I, I do my, my utmost best and, and the whole team, really, uh, we all do our best to make sure that the visuals that we show match with the scripts that we're talking about. However, there are times and occasions, like this story, where you're talking about people where there is no video footage of what you're talking about uh, directly. So we have to kind of go with, with what is available. This story was talking about uh, Taiwan's troops being trained, thus the video of troops from Taiwan uh, during training. So hopefully that helps uh, answer uh, some of the concerns or some of the questions you might have had about how we as journalists go about putting together some of the visuals. Uh, but again, LP, want to thank you for your service. The next story we have, uh, the next comms check comes to us on a story that we had done here at, at Weapons and Warfare about the Mind Gym. Um, and really, it's, uh, I, I ended that, that episode with, with my rap about NATO and uh, really how, how NATO was, was unique among all uh, military cooperations. Which we got this, uh, this message from Holt Crowder. It sounds like you do not think NATO members should be held to paying to be a part of NATO. That would be welfare on a country level. So what, uh, what Holt is referring to is in that rap, I had mentioned um, President, former President Trump had uh, kind of um, called out some NATO countries for not paying their fair share. My, my point was that's kind of an odd statement anyway, uh, because we as, as the United States don't get to decide how much other countries want to devote to their own national defense. Um, to your point, Holt, I'm not saying that NATOs shouldn't be held, uh, you know, held accountable or, or be kicked out for not paying. Um, I'm saying that's what NATO says. Uh, NATO says that countries aren't really held accountable or kicked out for not paying. All countries are encouraged to donate or, or to uh, devote 2% of their gross domestic product to national defense, that's kind of the, the baseline, uh, but not all countries do that, nor are all countries required to do that to be a part of NATO. Uh, they are required to put some funds toward national defense, but each country is allowed to make up their own minds on that. So all I'm, all I'm arguing for, Holt, is, is not necessarily that uh, NATO changes its rules to acquiesce to American politics, all I'm saying is American politics needs to realize that there are rules in place for NATO and we don't get to dictate to other countries how they follow those rules. So hopefully that helps answer some of your questions there, Holt. As for you out there in the audience, if you have a comment or a question that you would like us to address here on the show, you can comment below in the comment section or you can email us at weaponsandwarfare, all spelled out, at san.com. But in the meantime... That's comms check. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, it's time for the wrap. And I thought since we talked to three college professors this week, now might be a good time for a little lesson in Latin. The old Roman adage, se vis pacem parabellum, means if you want peace, prepare for war. Now, ideally, we would live in a world where there is no war, no strife, no famine, no need for any one nation to pick up arms against another. That's the ideal. But does that sound like anything real? Unfortunately, no. The last 80 years or so were actually relatively peaceful in historical terms, but they were hardly without conflict. And if the last few years are any indication of the decade ahead, then folks, winter is here. War is upon us. However you want to say it, if you value your way of life, then there will be people who, by necessity, will need to fight for it. People in Ukraine and Israel were trying to live peaceful lives until outside forces intervened. To get back to peace, both Israel and Ukraine needed to pick up arms. 
Failing to do so would mean the end of their people. Now, I don't think the U.S. mainland has much to fear in the way of enemy forces invading our territory. Not like Israel and Ukraine and most of the rest of the world have to worry about. Our geography grants us more safety and security than perhaps we deserve. But I also know we do not live in a vacuum. And what happens outside our borders impacts the decisions we make inside our borders. Which is why when we look around the world and we wonder aloud what is happening, we also need to ask ourselves, what are we willing to do to help make things right? War is a part of the equation now, and really, it always has been. We can accept that fact and start to deal with the current situation, or we can ignore it. Instead, hoping for the ideal while getting run over by the real. And that's where we're going to have to leave it for this week here at Weapons and Warfare. As always, if you'd like to share your thoughts with us, please do so by posting them in the section below or emailing us at weaponsandwarfare at san.com. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.